Okay, so uh, let me start. So, so last time uh, we looked at some difficulties in uh, breaking supersymmetry spontaneously using only the fields um, of the MSSM or the standard model. So if we only stick to the fields in the standard model but want to supersymmetrize them and want to uh, break uh, supersymmetry spontaneously, we saw that the supertrace theorem uh, will not let us do things in a phenomenologically acceptable way. So we have to um, add new fields and uh, we could build models. People have built lots of models about adding new fields and breaking uh, supersymmetry in, uh, in, uh, in that sector and communicating that to the standard model. We'll see examples of that explicitly uh, next time. Uh, the other option is to explicitly break supersymmetry, but in a way that will not spoil all of the nice, some of the nice properties of supersymmetry. And in that uh, uh, class, we'll see an example today of um, how you can break uh, supersymmetry explicitly, but this so-called soft supersymmetry breaking. So we'll uh, see the, um, the reason why this is called soft. Uh, it is to do with the quadratic divergence in the Higgs sector. So we'll explicitly see that even if you add some explicitly a sp a specific kinds of uh, explicit supersymmetry breaking terms, it won't reintroduce uh, quadratic divergence. So we'll explicitly work out the two-point function for the Higgs and then uh, see this working. Okay, so what I will do start with at least is soft supersymmetry breaking. So let's um, let's um, recap what is the problem in the Higgs sector in the standard model. This uh, quadratic divergence problem. So lambda squared problem in the standard model. And we all know that the Higgs sector is unstable in the standard model. What exactly is the origin of that? You all know that it is to do with the two-point function. So let me just look at one term which gives you the dominant contribution to the two-point function in the, uh, for the Higgs two-point function in the standard model, which is the top Yukawa coupling. And by this, I just mean the anti-symmetric product of H and Q, which is an SU2 uh, singlet. So I'll just denote that by a dot. So we can write this uh, Yukawa coupling, which is uh, a gauge singlet in the standard model. And uh, this will give, after the Higgs gets its vacuum expectation value, it will give, you, uh, give the top quark its mass. So I'm just writing down only the top or the up type thing, but we do the same thing for down type. We do three generation Yukawa coupling. We do all of that. But I'll just suppress all of the generation index, if you will, or in other words, only look at the top core contribution because that is the dominant one. Okay, so uh, so this, if I isolate the Higgs interaction in this thing, it'll look like. H U R bar U L minus M U U R bar U L plus H C. Where now I've taken the H zero. This is a vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field, and this is the physical degree of freedom. Uh, fluctuations around the vacuum. So uh, this is what we call as a physical Higgs particle for which I've written down the interaction. And this mass term mu will just be the contribution due to the wave and it will be the mass of the fermion. So it is just given by that. So now we have a massive um, fermion interacting with the Higgs uh, with the coupling lambda u. 
over square root of 2. So that's our simple uh, uh, theory that we want to focus on. And the, the dominant contribution to the Higgs two-point function will come from, so let me say it is just that this is a two-point function of Higgs. So this, if I draw a Feynman diagram for that, is just that, right? So this is the Higgs field, and this is the U quark here, up type quark or the top quark. Let me just write this. Right? So this will uh, give a correction to the Higgs mass. So there will be, I have not written down, but there will be a tree level value for the Higgs mass coming from the potential, which I have not written down. Um, and this will give a one loop correction to the Higgs mass, right. So let us just compute that. So this will be, I put a minus 1 because it is a fermion loop, right. This is a coupling squared because there are two of them. And then there is a loop momentum k, which I integrate over. This is um, undetermined. So I integrate over that loop momentum. And then there is a trace, the Dirac trace, over the, the two propagators, right? So I have just dropped the initial momenta if there is any uh, because I want to take the UV limit. I want to take, I want to look at the contribution to this when K is very large and I am imagining that the external momentum is small, uh, the form momentum is small and therefore it is a good approximation to just drop it when I am interested in the large momentum contribution in the loop. So I have just implicitly just dropped it, otherwise you will get uh, the external moment of P also coming in here. Uh, but because I want the large K limit, I will just not write it. This is similar to everybody, right? Very simple. So I am just doing the two-point function. <coughs> so now we will just estimate this thing. So we want to um, So I'll just write this d4k as k cube dk d omega k, or let me not put k here. So let's say d omega three is it? This is just the angular element. So I just call it d omega three in four dimensions. Um, and this is k cube dk. So I'm working explicitly in uh, four dimensions. So I can do the integral over the angular variables and this radial k. And uh, two pi squared. Yeah. So this will just give me two pi squared. And I'll only focus on uh, um, the k integration, so I'll get minus one. So this is i sigma will be minus one lambda u squared or two. And there's four k dk. So this k uh, can be um, as large as it wants, 
and you can see that trivially this integral is divergent, right? So uh, you see that something that goes like k d k will be quadratically divergent. So I'll imagine placing some momentum cutoff. I'll just cut it off at some large momentum lambda, and explicitly this will depend on lambda. And so the correction to this two-point function, I'll just call delta m h squared, and that is given by is that. So if we imagine that the standard model is valued up to very high um, energies or very short distance scales, then this lambda is big, and so the correction to the Higgs mass is big. It is quadratically sensitive to the cutoff. And so uh, we don't like such uh, theories, right? These are not good effective field theories where you have explicit cutoff dependence on quantities. So if I set the mass at tree level to be some value, small value to be accessible to current day experimentation, LHC can find it and so on. Uh, but this is saying at one loop, this is corrected to a large value, and the LHC should not see it, and so on. And therefore, in order to keep it light, I will have to cancel this contribution against the tree level value that I added. So I have to cancel. I have to choose the tree level, the bare mass, precisely in such a way to almost cancel off this large contribution. So I cancel off a large tree level value with a large loop corrected value in order to give me this 125 GeV that we have observed at the LHC. And that is a fine tuned theory, it's not a natural theory, and we don't like such theories. So we ask what can cure this problem, and the answer you know is that if supersymmetry uh, is um, a, a good symmetry in nature, it can uh, cure this problem, right? And so we just want to demonstrate that. So we see that there is a problem in the standard model that it is quadratically divergent uh, uh, or sensitive to the cutoff. And we'll just now supersymmetrize this thing and explicitly show that it will cancel off this uh, contribution. Yeah, that will also give a quadratic divergence. Numerically, uh, it is smaller because there is G, whereas for the top quark, this is 1, whereas G is some number like uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or something. So it's just numerically, it is smaller, so I've not bothered to write it. I've just focused on the top, but uh, the gauge bosons also will give you quadratically divergent contribution. So uh, this hopefully is clear to you from just the renormalization uh, um, uh, analysis that you have to fine tune the theory um, to maintain a light Higgs. And it's not a natural theory. Technically, it's fine. We can do it. There is nothing logically inconsistent in the standard model if you were to do this. It is just that it, you can take it as a signal that perhaps there is some other dynamics that will stabilize this sector. You can take it as a clue that, that perhaps there is new physics. But standard model is logically, it's a renormalizable theory. You can renormalize it, no, no problem. You can accommodate uh, a light Higgs. But it will be a fine-tuned theory. OK. This hopefully is very clear to you. Just take it as a review. And now let's go to demonstrating that uh, a supersymmetric theory will cancel off this thing. Now let's look at uh, supersymmetrizing this thing. So 
supersymmetrized, we just introduced uh, chiral superfields for all of these uh, uh, members that we saw. So we just take Q. So I have introduced uh, a superfield for this Q, which contains the fermion, the top quark in this case. But its super partner, which I called, which I call U twiddle, this is a scalar. This is a fermion. This is a scalar, and this is auxiliary field which we can integrate out by using the equation of motion. And similarly, I introduce a superfield U C, which will contain the U R bar, this thing. And then there is a corresponding scalar for this, which I call U R twiddle. Uh, and these, the bar and the star is all convention just to make it come out to be the usual way we define hypercharge and so on. You can redefine these fields to be something else and write it without the bar and so on. But it is just notation to correspond to what I have here to maintain the same hypercharge and so on that uh, we define this to be with this conjugate, right, with this conjugate in terms of gauge, but it's just notation. And then the Higgs, which uh, has uh, our uh, SU2, this is an SU2 doublet, this is an SU2 doublet, and this is an SU2 singlet, right? So this will be um, SU2 doublet. And they all have hypercharges the same way that they do in the standard model. I will not read it down, but it's all the standard assignments of hypercharge. Um, and so this is the usual Higgs, which will get a vacuum expectation value. And this is a fermionic partner of the Higgs, which is denoted as H twiddle. And these are, again, auxiliary fields which we can integrate out. So this is standard notation to put um, a twiddle on all of the super partners and leave the fields without the twiddle to be the standard model ones. So all of the twiddle ones are the extra particles that we introduce to complete the super multiplet, right? OK, so now I can uh, write down super potential. We'll just take a toy model with only this one generation. So the W, in fact, I won't write curly. I'll just write W. It'll be hard for me to keep writing this curly W. So this is just a product of chiral superfields, right? I can take, um, I should, in fact, take if it is allowed uh, quadratic also, but in this case, gauge symmetry will not allow anything. So I will only write down this one term because I have only these fields with, with me. So this is the super potential, and we can work out um, the Lagrangian from this, right? I just take the theta squared term of this product of chiral superfields. And the theta square term will be supersymmetry invariant, it'll, or it will transform to a total derivative. And the Lagrangian will be invariant. So all this I will skip. I will just write down what this is. So I am going through in detail this simple example because we'll use exactly this thing to generalize to the MSSM. I won't bother to write down the many equations that similar things will happen in the MSSM. I'll just write down the super potential. But I'll work out this in detail so that you know exactly how to compute for the MSSM case, the Lagrangian. So to the, for doing the MSSM, I'll just add to this thing. 
So this is one of the terms in the MSSM. So it will be easier to keep track of things, so I will just go through the detail here. So these are all uh, scalar things and uh, these are the fermion bilinears. And yeah, so we can uh, eliminate the F. So I can, uh, these are auxiliary fields, so I can just use the equation of motion and eliminate them and uh, I do that by for each one of these fields I can do that. So this will imply So this will be the, um, the constraints on F. So I can just eliminate them. I plug it back in there. And uh, then in the end, what I'm left with is lambda u squared. There's no. Here, here. Uh, there is no small what? Q. Q. 
Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Just change all of the Q to the U. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm abusing notation. I could have defined this as Q L twiddle and Q L. This should have really been uh, Q L. But I am writing a funny theory where only I am singling out the u and not bothering to keep track of the d. So um, yeah, you can change all of the q to, to u. So q uh, I use the notation q l right. So only in this Thai model you can replace this, but not in the MSSM case when I do the next, right? So that will have the, the actual SU2 and so on, but here I am not bothered to keep track of. Actually I have written this thing, but this is only when I do the MSSM case that I will be taking them as a singlet. So I should not have already said this here, but you can anticipate that when I go to the MSSM this will become an SU2 uh, doublet and so on. So here this will be scalar interactions and this will be fermion with scalar Yukawa type coupling. So I have only bothered to keep track of those. There are other terms which I have neglected. So any question on how you get this? So this should be trivial right uh, I am just doing the same thing as Ramesh did in the construction of the supersymmetric theory given a super potential how do you write down the Lagrangian right that is all I have done. So in this case I um, will just read out the couplings so what what I'll I'll just write down uh, what I need so so there'll be this U L U L U R U R these are the scalars minus I lambda U squared this is the coupling and then U L U L H H minus I lambda U squared over 2. There is a symmetry factor of 2 in this case. So U R U R H H minus I lambda U squared over 2 again a symmetry factor of 2 and then there will be fermionic couplings so there will be U L H will U R minus I lambda U over of two, and then H will you uh, you L or will minus I lambda U over square root of two. So this are the interactions that are present in this uh, supersymmetrized version, right? So 
this this is similar to what we had in the standard model but now I have all of these extra vertices because of um, supersymmetry so it requires some relation between bosons and fermions and so we have to have uh, these kinds of relations so all of these couplings you see are all given by lambda u and so this is um, again a realization of this statement that if supersymmetry is exact many couplings will be related so the fermion couplings and scalar couplings will all be related exactly right so these have to be the exact same coupling which will persist to uh, loop order if supersymmetry is exact of course if supersymmetry is broken then these uh, at loop level the corrections will uh, be different but if supersymmetry is exact like it is here all the couplings will have to be related and that is very essential fact of supersymmetry if you want to test supersymmetry for instance you would use this fact that you would do some scattering and see that uh, the fermionic uh, coupling will be the same as some uh, scalar coupling in practice it may not be so easy to do this but in principle at least if you want to test supersymmetry this is what you would do you would somehow try to get observables that are sensitive to fermionic couplings and their corresponding uh, scalar partners and you would test that the couplings are the same but in practice it's not so easy to uh, do this test so there are various other ways that you will have to uh, test it so now um, the fermion mass will and scalar masses in this case will be will come about after this electroweak symmetry breaking the same way as in the standard model I have not written down the potential when we go to the MSSM and uh, do this later on we can we will see how to write down the potential which will get this web and so on but for now I will just assume that the potential is such that this Higgs uh, gets a non-trivial vacuum expectation value which we call V and all of the fermion and scalar masses come about by that and if I just write down the mass terms uh, I'll find and you see the scalars and the fermions have the same mass this is again a result of the exact supersymmetry that bosons and fermions are degenerate in mass and I can define the SUSY mass to be just lambda u v over square root of 2 so now we had the same thing as in the standard model right this mass and now we have supersymmetrized and we have seen that the scalars also are degenerate in mass so the u quark mu ms and then or let me write it this way this is both left and right so this is again if you want to test supersymmetry you would do this and this we said is a prediction of supersymmetry which is no, not true in the real world right so we have to uh, now get around this problem so we have seen explicitly in this example that they are degenerate and if we have to make it a theory of the real world so somehow we have to make these not the same as that this we have many light fermions in the standard model electron u quark and so on and so we will just see how you can raise the mass of this thing so we raise the mass of this thing by adding
to just m squared. So I just add that by hand. Of course, this is not allowed in supersymmetry. If I make a supersymmetry transformation, now things will go haywire, right? I have this thing for the scalars, but a supersymmetry transformation can take these scalars to fermions. But now I have not added the same mass term to the fermions, so obviously it is not supersymmetry, right? So I've destroyed supersymmetry by just adding this explicitly breaking term, uh, but uh, there is no way around it. I have to add this kind of a term because I want to uh, um, to destroy the degeneracy of fermions and scalars. So this is what is called as a soft breaking term, a soft breaking mass. And so when we go to the MSSM, we'll add such masses for all of the particles in the standard model and make them heavy. So now all I have to do is to make sure that this is chosen big enough to evade to have evaded detection so far. So I'll just make it, depending on what field it is, I'll make it just heavy enough to um, escape constraints. So one other kind of term that you can add the so-called A terms which look like this. So this is uh, just by definition that I have written down a lambda u here, this is the same lambda u as appearing in the superpotential, but this is some new parameter that I've added into the Lagrangian. So again, this is a SUSY breaking, oh, so sorry, this should be SUSY breaking. So it is a SUSY breaking term because I've just added it for the scalars without adding the corresponding term for the fermions. In other words, it did not come out of the superpotential. I just added it into the Lagrangian. And so this will explicitly break supersymmetry, but this parameter now is mass dimension one. You can just see that, right? Lambda u is dimensionless. A is some mass dimension one quantity. So the mass dimension of so these are the so-called A terms. So A terms have mass dimension one. So I can again add this for all of the fields of the standard model, such terms. And why do we add these kinds of terms? Because what I'm going to demonstrate next, that even though we broke su supersymmetry by adding these, it will not reintroduce quadratic divergence in, uh, um, in the Higgs sector. Uh, note that I have not done anything to these couplings, right? So I have not, for instance, if I add another term which looks like this, right? Without adding it for the corresponding fermions, if I add such couplings, then it will reintroduce quadratic divergence. So that is a hard breaking of supersymmetry. And I will not add terms like that, but only such terms. And the general rule of thumb is, I don't know if it is an exact theorem or what, but at least that if you add terms which have mass dimension, positive mass dimension, not dimensionless quantities, those are soft breaking. So. Uh, these are mass dimension 2 that I've added, right, mass squared, and this is mass dimension 1. But I've not added any dimensionless uh, breaking terms. So everything has positive mass dimension, and the rule of thumb is as long as you do that, then uh, it is uh, soft breaking. In? The one in the yeah, it is explicitly supersymmetry breaking. I just added it. So I took the theory which was supersymmetric and I added only for the scalars this term. 
which the analog of that term is absent the L um well after the wave you get it right so if i put a wave um you have put a h there that's right so that is right so i suppose you are right so yeah yeah there is nothing in the super potential which mixes u l u r yeah it was absent in the suzy case no but then now the, the i can add all kinds of such scalar terms i mean i am only adding this one particular thing anticipating the gauge invariance in the standard model so which needs a left right Yeah, it will reintroduce, but with a positive mass dimension. That is the point. As long as you uh, have positive mass dimension, it will reintroduce a new vertex, but uh, it has positive mass dimension. It's not a dimensionless thing, and it will not lead to a quadratic divergence. We'll explicitly see that. so this new vertex that you are talking about so i can do the h right i can take the thing and now i'll extract out a coupling which so this is a new vertex that it introduces but the claim is that this is still fine although this is a supersymmetric breaking it will not reintroduce quadratic divergence in other words it's a soft breaking term so i can write everywhere here soft again um, to reiterate i could have added all kinds of terms right such terms but you will see that when we go to the standard model case that it only this one will be allowed because of gauge invariance i cannot write ul star ulh because that will not be an su to singlet and so on uh so only these kinds of terms will be allowed uh, after you pay attention to the gauge symmetry in the standard model but in the star example i could have written other things but i won't because i'm anticipating that i'll continue this to the standard model So any question about this so this is a key thing that we'll just generalize to the mssm okay to demonstrate the claim that this will not reintroduce quadratic divergence again i'll look at the two point function of the higgs so we had the same earlier contribution now i will get this new contribution due to the scalars so this is h h u l so it can be u l or u r the scalars so i'll get this extra contribution due to the scalars that are present so we see that this comes from uh, these two things here right i have just closed the loop on these and i can write down uh, another contribution to the two point function so now this the coupling was as in the standard model and this coupling is minus i lambda u squared as we found here right minus i lambda is square so that is for the scalars now let me call this as sigma 1 and this as sigma 2 uh so we already did sigma 1 so i'll just do sigma 2 
I will drop the plus i epsilon um, just assume that to be there. So this is for this second thing the first one I have already done so I won't repeat so this is the second skip all of the details just write down the final answer. So this thing is 2 pi squared. So let's see. So this 2 I can cancel. So lambda u squared, lambda squared over 2 pi to the fourth, uh, 2 pi squared. Is that what I had earlier? So this 2 is the same, I will just take it here, pi squared I cancel, so 16 pi squared, which should be what I had earlier. Yeah, so this is with a minus sign here because of this fermion loop, minus 1 from there, and uh, this is with a plus because this is a bosonic, uh, this is a bosonic loop, so I have this, but they are exactly the same. And I only kept the large momentum uh, uh, contributions, right? The k large. So I have not bothered to do it exactly. So I should uh, write this as k large. This is not an exact computation, right? So it, it, like if I do it exactly, I'll get some mass and so on. So this is just the k large because that is where the divergence is coming from and at least we see that the divergence cancels. So I sigma 2 or it might give you some finite pieces, right? but only the large momentum uh, contributions will be 0. In other words, there is no quadratic divergence. There could be other contributions uh, due to uh, masses and so on. There might be things proportional to m squared and so on, but at least there is nothing proportional to lambda squared because that is a contribution that comes in only at large lambda or large k. So no. So this is a good effective theory, there is no explicit dependence on the cutoff and therefore it is a natural theory. So supersymmetry renders the Higgs sector natural because it cancels off the uh, quadratic divergence problem. So any question about that? Sorry? Yes. Ah, good point. So I will add that later on. So before I add that, let me just compute it more exactly. Let me extract the finite contributions and then I will compute uh, the new interactions what I added, the contribution to the two-point function from that new interaction. So that will also be there. But we will show that when we do that, that will be finite. It will not in, uh, introduce a quadratic divergence. So this was a demonstration just to pull out the large large uh, k uh, contributions, but we will write down the exact expression also uh, including the mass. So the windows are closed, are they? No, they are.
So let's do it more exactly. We'll keep the m squared pieces and so on. And we want to see how exactly the two-point function depends on the masses, the scalar and fermion masses. So I will not bother writing down all of the integrals again. So you do the same things, right? Integrals are the same. And uh, now um, uh, let me just write down in the beginning, and then I'll write down the final answer. So. So this is the trace of what we had earlier. So this is the integral that we have. And to keep the masses everything, so use uh, dimensional regularization. So these are divergent integrals, so I need to regulate them. So we can just use dimensional regularization um, for this purpose. So. Um, I will not write down the details. So let me just use write down one of them. So and so on right you can just work it out so these are divergent so you explicitly see the appearance of uh, the 1 over epsilon poles and so you can write down everything and uh, I'll write down the final answer so for this thing Where here, for simplicity, I've just I've set the two uh, scalar masses to be the same. So here I've got the but exact still still log it. lambda piece. So it is still logarithmically divergent even in the presence of supersymmetry. It's just that there is no uh, quadratic divergence. So we know how to 
uh, take care of log divergence using the usual uh, renormalization prescription, which they are even in gauge theories, right? So we can treat that in the same way. It will not give you a uh, huge sensitivity to the uh, cutoff. Logarithmic dependence is only a mild dependence, so it's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not, it's still a natural theory with a log divergence. It's not a finite theory, right? Supersymmetry doesn't render the theory finite. It just uh, gets rid of the quadratic divergence as we have seen. Okay, and you notice that if if this is true, then the above is zero. All right, should say delta. Let me write it as. If there is exact degeneracy, then the loops exactly cancel. There is not even a logarithmically divergent piece. It's only in the limit that they are not equal because I've added soft breaking terms, do I get a log divergent piece. You know, this doesn't seem to stop. Is some window open? Can you just check that if that window is open? It's a pretty loud thing. Oh, it's just loud. Okay, now that extra contribution that we had, so we just include that also. So uh, let's say I sigma 3, the third contribution, I'll just write down due to the A terms. And this is minus I A lambda over square root of 2. Right, that's what we had there. So we can just compute that also. And I'll just write down the final answer. So of course, I have not demonstrated that it is not quadratically divergent because dimensional regularization does not see quadratic divergent pieces, right? It can only uh, give you log divergent pieces. But you can explicitly demonstrate using momentum cutoff that there is no quadratic divergence. So demonstrate immersed in doing it. Okay. So any questions? So this is the crux of the matter in supersymmetry why it is useful for phenomenology and all that uh, because this property 
and we'll uh, come back and use these expressions when we uh, when we do the Higgs um, when we compute the contribution to the Higgs the the little hierarchy problem all of that So everybody knows MSSM structure here? Uh, no? So I oh okay, I'll write it down, yeah. So from what I wrote down it is a trivial extension. So you know what MSSM stands for, right? It is the minimal. So you define one abbreviation in terms of another abbreviation, right? So it's a minimal supersymmetric standard model. So the word minimal means that we don't add any extra fields. So we just stick to the same fields as in the standard model, and uh, um, just supersymmetrize them. Sorry, can, uh, would it be possible to just tell them to uh, stop? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll just write only here, so you can just leave it uh, here and uh, that if you can just tell them, you know, because it's like. Okay, so the gauge theory, the structure of the gauge theory, the gauge sector is uh, same as how we construct any supersymmetric uh, gauge theory. So I will not repeat all of that here. So you build an in invariance under SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. I won't repeat all of the uh, structure. So it's exact same prescription that one uses to build a supersymmetric gauge theory. And uh, all I have to now specify is the super potential, so which we just write. And if you want, you could introduce a neutrino superfield also, although in the minimal version you could leave it out and give the neutrino masses by non renormalizable terms. So you could do that, or you can introduce this neutrino uh, terms also. So this is all. Uh, this carry flavor indices which I have suppressed. So you can put this. Right, that is a three generation. I and J take the uh, three generation case and these are constant matrices which are 3 by 3. Same structure as in the standard model Yukawa coupling. So we just write down this uh, super potential and the one extra field that we had to introduce is
So it is like the two Higgs doublet standard model, right? You can write down just the standard model, but you can introduce one extra Higgs doublet and write down a two Higgs doublet model. And supersymmetry needs this for uh, since W is holomorphic. So W is a holomorphic function of the superfield. So if I write down HU, I cannot write down HU dagger in the superfield. And therefore, uh, in order to give masses to both the up type and the down type uh, quarks, I will need to introduce one other HD. Although you can think of it for anomaly cancellation, uh, because there is a Higgsino, I need to cancel anomalies or equivalently, or I shouldn't say equivalently, or for anomaly cancellation also I need to introduce one extra Higgs doublet. So the minimal version needs two Higgs doublets so which are the H up and H down. You can think of the extra one that we added as the H down. The H up has the sa same quantum numbers as in the standard model. So, so the Q field is so this has quantum numbers sorry let me write it like this so it is a triplet under SU3 a doublet under SU2 and has hypercharge 1 sixth so and so on you I will not bother writing down this thing so it is pretty uh, obvious right how you do the notation or should I write it down it is important because if you take anything you will all see the component fields written down in something but it is um, it's pretty uh, obvious. Uh, these are all the scalar components and uh, these are all the fermions. So same thing as in this toy model that I wrote down but um, So that is this thing right and this thing is any questions about that? So now this is a um, super potential so then we can the same way as I worked out last time now there are many more fields that you have to keep track of so you just write down the uh, super symmetry invariant Lagrangian and so this that will give you a super symmetric theory. So this will of course reproduce the standard model but there will be extra particles all of these super particles the super partners scalars hexenos gauginos all of these will be extra and uh, because supersymmetry there will be degenerate in mass with the 
standard model particles and we do not want that so we will add a supersymmetry breaking uh, sector so L soft breaking for the MSSM. So in this um, for the gauge nose you just write it as let me just write down the fields. So you have SU3 uh, sector which you write it as G mu A these are the gluons call this as D3, D2. This is just the notation that people normally use for the SU3 uh, gauge multiplet the vector multiplet. So this these are the standard model gauge bosons the gluons the W and the B and these are their super partners the gauge enos the gluino, vino and the bino. Um, so these are new particles again which um, will be present and we have to give them masses also in order for them not to have been observed. So this soft supersymmetry breaking terms is going to involve masses for all of these scalars which have to be made heavy and the gauge enos, uh, the Higgs enos that I did not write down right. So H up is uh, again the super field H up then the Higgs eno and this is a chiral super multiplet right FHU and HD. So I have to give masses for the Higgs sinos also which are new fermions in the Higgs sector. So the L soft MSSM is going to contain masses for all of these plus the A terms that are consistent with gauge symmetry. The most general A terms which I can write down consistent with the gauge symmetry. Generalization of whatever I had earlier uh, but we can write down many more terms because now we have many more fields. So QL dagger So again for the leptons I am not writing down the super field for the neutrinos and uh, the soft breaking terms but if you want you can add those also. Um, these are the A terms. It is just convention to pull out the lambda u and then define another AU. So note that I have suppressed the generation index so this will all be 3 by 3 matrices in uh, generation space right. 
Hermitian matrices in this case. For this, all three of them, right? Do we know? So I've just written down in common notation lambda, but there'll be uh, m1, m1, m2, m3 for each of the gauge genomes. So this is called as the mu term here. So this was allowed by the gauge invariance, right? H, H up, H down. And similarly here for the scalars, H up, H down. All of these are scalars here. And these are fermions and they are in the gauge multiply. So these are the most general soft breaking terms that we can write down and uh, has been written down for the MSSM. Any questions about that? So you see there are many, many parameters now. So all of these, all I know is that I have to make pick these parameters such that they make the scalars heavy enough to have escaped all kinds of constraints because there is no uh, hint of supersymmetry yet. And so uh, one thing that I know is that I have to pick all of those that are heavier than a certain value or bigger than a certain value. But beyond that, I don't know uh, anything in there. So it's a general parameterization. So when I told you that this is the most general thing possible, that is not quite right. So we can write down other terms also in the superpotential, which are not there in the renormalizable standard model. And I could write down, for instance, consistent with the gauge symmetries, uh, something that breaks lepton number. So I can write down uh, L E C. So this is consistent with all of the gauge symmetries in the standard model and I can write it down in the super potential although I do not write it down for the reason that I will mention and I can write down things that violate baryon number also. Again these have all uh, generation indices. So this is a double prime. So if 
So this is suggestive. So this violates lepton number by one unit. This violates baryon number by one unit. So you know that if you um, violate baryon number and lepton number, there are very tight limits. So what what is the problem if you violate baryon number? Anybody? If I have lepton number violation, baryon number violation, what is the problem? Huh? Yeah, proton decays, right? So for instance if I turn on both of these then you have so this can form a pi 0 and this is a proton. So you can have P plus going to E plus pi 0 for instance there are other possibilities also. So the proton will decay mediated by these interactions. So I suppose this is lambda prime is it? No this is lambda double prime and this has come from lambda prime. So this decay rate can be uh, um, much lesser than one second or inverse one second if both of these are order one and the, the scalars um, are of the order of one TV. So generically you assume the scalars to be at least around 1 TV scale few hundred GV to 1 TV and if these couplings are order 1 then the proton decays with a very short lifetime much lesser than a second and certainly the bounds are do not allow that the proton decay the bound is something like 10 to the 32 years. Right? It is a very stringent bound and of course this violates it in a huge um, huge way. So of course the way to keep it consistent is to make these lambda prime and lambda double prime so small that you take it below that. So you can allow these terms or you can only allow one of them because in order for this to happen both baryon number and lepton number have to be violated. So you can allow only one of these in which case proton is uh, stable and that is certainly fine. No, this is all renormalizable. It's the same thing, right? I only went up to cubic and uh, bilinear, so they're all renormalizable. In the standard model, uh, baryon number is violated by higher dimensional operators, but in a supersymmetric theory, we find that we can write down these terms consistent with um, gauge symmetry that will induce renormalizable operators, which will let the proton decay. Okay, so certainly I can choose, I can allow these and choose these to be very tiny. So you can see that they have to be incredibly tiny. I mean, I don't know, I man. You have to get this 32 orders of magnitude suppression from just the coupling. So uh, probably fourth root of that if I take um, these things. So it will be squared fourth root. So yeah, if I take fourth root of that, so it should be of the order of 10 to the minus 8 or something for this to be allowed. So I can choose these couplings to be lesser than 10 to the minus 8 and then await these browns or I can um, introduce a new symmetry and forbid these operators which is uh, commonly considered. So this is called as R parity. So you can impose an, an extra symmetry uh, 
which has uh, no analog in the standard model. So you just define that to be or I shouldn't say no analog it is just that we do not have to invoke this in the standard model it automatically baryon number turns out to be uh, um, and lepton number turns out to be accidental symmetries of the renormalizable standard model. So I can allow uh, uh, non renormalizable operators but if we assume that the scale of these operators are very high automatically the, uh, the proton lifetime comes out to be fine uh, provided I choose a cutoff which is high enough. So that structure is already uh, accidentally present in the standard model whereas here it is not there so I have to invoke a new symmetry and if I invoke this symmetry uh, where B is baryon number and L is lepton number. So you can just take for instance the B of uh, quark field is one third right and uh, baryon number of a lepton is uh, 0 and uh, the lepton number of a Q is 0 lepton number of oh sorry for the notation <laughs> you know what this means right right it just stands for lepton number and uh, baryon number. <coughs> so this is you impose on the super field So you can just work it out. So all of these carry baryon number one third. Okay, this has baryon number minus one third. This has plus one third. And this carries lepton number. This carries lepton number. So this will tell you what are the charge assignments for PM, the so called matter parity. This is called matter parity. And you will just you can work out whether it is plus 1 or minus 1 for these fields and you can convince yourself that this assignment will forbid all of these terms. So on the component fields this is equivalent to uh, assigning uh, an R parity PR. where uh, S is a spin so for the scalar component of course S is 0 for the fermionic component S is 1 half vector it is 1 and so on and uh, on the component fields you can equivalently define this uh, R parity and um, assign for the scalars and fermion different R parities. So this is the same content as this one and you will find certain uh, all you will find that all of those interactions there will uh, conserve R parity it that is if I take the product of the R parities of each of these component fields that it will be plus 1 whereas these break R parity. So if I take the product of the R parities of all of these fields the interactions that follow from this will break R parity. So if I impose this R parity then I will have to forbid all of these terms and the proton will be absolutely stable if I do that or I should not say absolutely stable again you can write down non renormalizable terms in the super potential which will still violate baryon number and lepton number which is still fine but at least there will be no renormalizable interactions that will let the proton decay like we had this so it will completely kill these kinds of uh, diagrams and so for phenomenology sake for proton decay one usually uh, or mostly people consider um, theories with R parity so this thing is R parity mostly people consider R parity conserving uh, theories but you do not have to.
So just quickly, I'll point out uh, the consequences of our, our, our parity conservation. So one thing is because of this assignment on the component fields, you will find that all of the scalars, the PR um, of the fermions of the standard model fermions, let's say leptons, quarks, all of these are plus one and the R parity of, you know, so this is of the scalars are all minus one, R parity of the Higgs is plus one R parity of the Higgsino minus one, R parity of the gauge bosons plus one, R parity of the gauge genos minus one. So all of the super particles will have R parity minus one and all of the standard model particles will have R parity plus one. So you can easily convince yourself by just this thing that that is true. And so one important consequence is that there will be no interaction where you can take, like let's say I have some SUSY particle, some scalar or gauge geno or something, right? And so this has R parity minus one. So there will be no interaction which will take this to all standard model particles. So this will not happen because this, All of these have R parity uh, plus one, so the product of them will be plus, whereas there is one single uh, R parity minus particle, so this kind of an interaction will never appear in an R parity conserving uh, supersymmetric theory. So this means that this, uh, this thing cannot decay, right? So the lightest of these guys, so of course a heavier of this can decay to a lighter and so I can have so some SUSY particle giving me another SUSY particle and a standard model particle and this thing can go to another SUSY particle and standard model and so on, right? This can happen. But the lightest of these cannot decay to standard model particles. So the lightest supersymmetric particle the so called LSP, right, will be stable. So the lightest of these cannot decay to any other uh, supersymmetric particle. It cannot decay to standard model particles because of R parity conservation. So it will end up being stable. So LSB, LSP is absolutely stable and can be a dark matter candidate. So this is a very nice feature of supersymmetry of R parity conserving supersymmetry that uh, for proton decay purposes we impose this R parity but we find that it automatically implies uh, an absolutely stable particle which can be the dark matter that we are observing in cosmology and so on. Um, so it gives you a dark matter candidate and it has important implications for collider things also. So now if I have some standard model particle colliding. Now I have to produce two R parity minus one um, particles together. I have to pair produce SUSY particles. I cannot singly produce, so I cannot turn this around. I cannot take two standard model particles and produce a single supersymmetric particle. And therefore, in an R parity conserving theory, um, I have to always pair produce super particles in a collider. So that's another consequence of R parity conservation. And once this is produced, now the same thing here, when it decays, it will have to decay to the LSP, right? It has to decay. There has to be one R parity minus one particle in the decay chain after, after this cascade. This is called as a cascade decay. It can cascade and then eventually it has to go to the LSP. And the LSP is a dark matter candidate if it is charge neutral, right? Of course, we cannot have electromagnetically charged dark matter, it would no longer be dark. So 
if the LSP is electromagnetically neutral, then it can be a dark matter candidate. And the same thing will tell you that that uh, electromagnetically neutral particle will not interact in the detector. <coughs> there will be a massive particle which just exits the detector. And uh, this will be, um, so let us say I just write it. So it can be standard model. So this is R parity minus 1. And so there is standard model and then another SUSY particle. And this can go to standard model again. And then eventually it has to go to the LSP, which will be missing energy. So there will be missing energy in the detector and that is a classic signature of supersymmetry. And these dark matter candidates are called uh, WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particle. So it has weak interaction. So if you take the Gagino for instance, it interacts weakly. It, uh, it interacts with G2 strength, right? The SU2 gauge coupling. And it is uh, a massive particle because supersymmetry breaking, we made sure that it is massive, a few hundred GeV. So it is a weakly interacting massive particle. And it is a thermal dark matter candidate. So the usual thermal freeze out if you do, you will get roughly this, the required um, relic density for hundreds of GeV uh, mass of these particles. So all of these are consequences of R parity conservation. And of course, if you violate R parity, then these need not be uh, there and the signatures will be different. Okay, sorry, I went over a little bit, but uh, I wanted to at least complete this one. Any questions before I stop? Uh, that depends on the model. So there is no overall thing, that, but um, roughly you can say that it has to be uh, a few, like 100 GeV or above from LEP. If it is lighter than that, LEP should have seen hints of that in missing energy. So if you look at events in LEP where you produce a lot of missing energy, you will produce, um, if you produce too many of them, you can violate those constraints. So that will place something few tens of GeV to 100 GeV in that range depending on the model and which, which LSP. The LSP composition, the LSP will try to uh, write down that, but the LSP, all these particles after electroweak symmetry breaking, all of these particles can mix. So for instance, the LSP can be some combination of the Bino, Bino the neutral guys and the uh, Higgs Eno. Right, H up, H down. So, what linear combination depends on the theory, not on the model. So, depending on whether it is predominantly Bino or predominantly Higgsino, you can get the very weak bounds or strong bounds and so on. So, it all depends on what admixture of these things the LSP is. And um, it will roughly range from a few tens of GeV to hundreds of GeV, so depending on. So um, it also depends on which constraints. So there are direct collider constraints, and there are dark matter detection constraints. You know, there are various probes of dark matter direct detection, which will also put constraints, and so on. So roughly tens of GeV to hundred GeV. Any other questions? Okay, let's stop. <laughs>